Okay, I may draw on the board. I'll try and do my impression of the United States um, and try and replicate my uh, normal plots that I show everyone. Um, so I'm first going to talk quickly about uh, the paper that we've recently published in Nature Climate Change, uh, which is based on the news model, and then um, I'm more going to talk about uh, sort of the the side results that I think are important from that and some, some work I've done since then. Um, the first thing that we did for the Nature Climate Change paper, or uh, what I did, was build this news model, a national energy with weather system. And um, I kind of came at it from a mathematical standpoint. Rather than uh, learning all the regulations and trying to fit within the existing grid, I said, well, what would happen if uh, we use large scale? So I, I looked at weather maps a lot. And uh, I come from England. And uh, the whole country is cloudy. Uh, consistently and uh, I thought well we can't really do it in England it doesn't really work if you want solar uh, there and so with the US it's not the same it's very 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 large and I did uh, a quick analysis um, that looked at the wind speed variability with scale uh, and this is the variability um, and then this is scale and it was a logarithmic plot and what we showed was uh, for the United States um, there's about a 20% variability and for the current balancing authorities is about 100% variability. And so that changes depending on which uh, balancing authority you're in, of course. Some are bigger, some are smaller. But essentially what it means is that if you're in these small regions, if you've got a variable generator, um, you're going to get periods of time where there's no generation. Um, and you can circumvent that a bit by storage. And you can also use uh, different technology, so wind and solar together, which will reduce it some more. This is just wind. Um, but you're going to have these periods where you're going to get these lulls. And you know, we would uh, talked about that earlier in terms of these multi-day events that occur. Um, these multi-day events occur less as you go bigger and bigger. Um, there's never a time when you look at the whole globe average that there's a wind speed of zero, 80 meters. It just doesn't happen average across the globe. Um, but then the hard part comes, well, you can't put a wind turbine everywhere. You can't put um, solar everywhere. So you have to do some subset of that. And that's kind of what the news model uh, sort of s started from in terms of a how do you pick the smallest set of uh, generators that you want to try and make your grid work reliably? Um, and then um, I realized that cost mattered. Um, so I did the sort of back of the envelope thing and said, well, it needs to be reliable, but then costs really matter. And so the whole premise of the news model was that we did it without any carbon constraints. So everything we did for the paper and have done since is purely driven by costs. Um, and luckily, it's a cost minimization model, so you can put in uh, lower costs and you get a lower cost out. Um, but we tried to do some analysis of where the costs uh, were representative of different uh, areas. And what we found is if you allow the model to build transmission, um, it always seems to build it. And we used HVDC for long links between uh, large different uh, regions. And we tried to sort of look at the question from why, why does long distance transmission work? And at first we thought it was, well, you're just getting to ship uh, non-correlated sources to uh, to a, d a demand center that's further away. So, for example, you could ship Montana wind to South Florida um, because they're more correlated. Um, but it actually turned out there was more sort of uh, detail than that. Well, actually, what happens is it allows them to sell in different markets at different times. Uh, and that's where the network uh, came in. Rather than it just being a point-to-point -point source, it was a network that allowed the Montana wind to sell into California in the morning. In the afternoon, it could sell to New York. And then in the evening, it could sell locally if it wished to. Uh, and that actually drove real big cost reductions, because you can add these generators together in a way um, that actually reduces the variability. So then you don't need as much um, reserve. You don't need as much uh, backup generation. Uh, but it doesn't, it doesn't get to zero. So for the, the, the Nature Climate Change paper, we had about 20% uh, dispatchable from natural gas. Um, and we did experiments with uh, something that I think is not um, utilized enough. Um, so I'm trying to go to the underappreciated um, the P2G2P um, pathway, um, power to gas to power, um, which uh, some German, uh, German companies are looking at it more extensively than we are here. Um, but instead of going to hydrogen, they go to gas. <clears throat> and they use it for cars at the moment, but they could also use it for uh, storing electricity uh, so they could burn it later on, um, or fuel cells. Um, I think this is a bit underutilized at the moment in models um, and pathways that can go in. Um, and that then directly links you into another sector, which is the natural gas sector, which really has a big impact. If we're looking at variable generation, gas is going to be a big driver. And what we found in the Northeast was if you get a cold winter and you start ramping up the amount of natural gas you need, 
price goes up, and then suddenly we have shortages. And uh, that will become more and more apparent if the grid doesn't expand. Um, I wanted to note that what we found was, um, Nate was talking about you could take California, multiply it by eight, and you get the US. It doesn't work that way, unfortunately. We can't, um, we can't scale from one location outwards. And the reason is this. Um, California looks like that. Um, and unfortunately, the variability is predominantly uh, in the uh, east-west direction. And so we've also got SP, uh, SPP, which is a, a south southern power pool, which is also aligned that way. And we also have MISO, which is doing the same thing. And so uh, when I did a study for MISO, I found that they needed 50% backup because they don't have the uh, longitudinal variability that you need to actually mitigate um, some of these issues that happen. North-south, you get a little bit of that, but really it's the east-west uh, direction. Um, and that's really been missed in California because it's, it's not exactly a, a rectangle, but it's pretty close. Um, and you've got these external factors like uh, the sea, the, the cloud deck moving in, in, in during the daytime. Um, and so when we dig more into the model, this last um, uh, piece, so we get to 80% without uh, carbon taxes, without any... Um, constraints, but that's where it stops. And so then um, I did lots of sensitivities saying, well, maybe we need demand uh, response. And we found that about 80% is still the solution. It costs a little bit less because you get to shape the curve a bit better. And rather than it being a static um, input, it's a variable um, uh, within the model. Uh, we then looked at storage, and we had it down as, as low as um, $75 per uh, uh, kilowatt installed, I think, or... $750 per kilowatt installed, uh, 75 cents per watt. And uh, we found it only put in about 10 to 15 gigawatts across the whole US, but it was strategically placed and more transmission was built so that they could essentially utilize those lines more frequently um, rather than over capacity them. Um, and so what we found from doing the, the solar one is if you uh, put electric vehicles in, um, you end up getting, and I think uh, one of the questions earlier showed this, uh, if you put electric vehicles and you electrify everything, the normal curve would look like um, a double hump like this. And with the uh, solar, you get this huge peak here. And this would all be charging electric vehicles. Um, and the reason I bring that up is because um, weather forecasting is not perfect. Um, I don't know if anyone else has noticed that. Um, and uh, if you miss all this charging that could be happening, there's going to be some really big issues later on. And so the day ahead and the the hour ahead forecasting becomes more and more important, but then the seasonal forecasting becomes hugely important because how are you going to store that long-term uh, driver? Because solar is going to ramp up in summer, but in winter you're going to lose it. And uh, we've tried with the model to expand nuclear and allow it to ramp, and it only adds another 50 or so percent to, to what exists today. Um, and the reason is, is because um, the value to the grid is really important uh, about where you can locate the, the nuclear and the the hydro as well, which is another variable. Um, and what we found is with the, with the wind and solar, you can't really go off what they do with the PPA, which is find the cheapest resource, uh, get a PPA, cheap price, and then sell into the grid, because that's not the best value to the grid. The best value to the grid might be somewhere that's less uh, capacity factor, but a better correlation to the load you're trying to serve, or multiple loads. And uh, we did a lot of work on this, and we found that if you were to build in um, Iowa, the next place you should build, given everything else held constant, would be the middle of Montana. And uh, it kind of, this is just to illustrate the issue we have, is uh, Montana's in a different interconnect, let alone a different market. Um, and how would you connect those and allow them to interact with each other? And so um, I would say the technical problem is um, getting markets to have software that allows them to think about value rather than just uh, linear costs or uh, marginal costs. And of course, as Sonia said, the uh, just using the marginal cost as your dispatch um, really hampers things that cost a lot of money to install but very cheap to run. Um, and the P PPAs, uh, the PTC and the ITC, while they're good, um, in small regions they actually end up making you build in the wrong places. So uh, if you can get a negative price on your energy and still make profit, which to me I still have a bit of a difficulty getting my head around that, but they can do that now because of the P P P uh, PTC then why would they want to build somewhere else? And so um, if, you grow, if you expand to larger grids, then they'll, they'll build in more reasonable locations. And I've spoken to some um, wind developers who 
I would say, are more at the forefront of this kind of idea of, I want to arbitrage against your crazy idea that a national grid might happen, because if it does happen, I know that my stuff in MISO is going to be um, redundant because it's not going to have the value I thought it had if there was no expansion, uh, particularly in the Eastern Interconnector. So um, we've got to look at a bigger uh, region. 80% uh, is what wind and solar can get you, uh, give or take, over the US continent um, area. If you connect to Canada and you connect to Mexico, you can get um, quite a bit more. But the, the question becomes is, as you add more and more variable sources and uh, more and more demand response and things like that, is, is it the only answer? And I think the, the obvious one is, no, it's not the only answer. It's one of many. But we shouldn't be um, dismissing it because it's hard, because I think um, every study I've seen, I think pretty much every study I've seen, is transmission is useful. Um, it doesn't have to be national scale. Um, and I just wanted to come back to Nate's point about rooftop PV versus utility. Um, rooftop PV is less valuable if you've got a national grid because um, you get these diversions that happen when cloud decks come over where you get more demand and less generation in these small areas. But you could build it in a remote place, which is always more correlated to the load. So if you have solar on your roof and you can look at it, um, you'll see in summer, if you use air conditioning, you'll see the solar go up and down, and then you'll see your demand go up and down, and it's offset by a time zone or two. So if you, if you put it in California and you choose time zones eastwards, you can actually get better um, correlation. Um, and that's where um, Brian was talking about those two peaking periods, morning and the evening. That's partly due to that effect of, uh, of moving it. But the rooftop PV means that the consumer gets to pay, so the grid wins that way. Um, and also you get added, added, added benefits of you know, cooling of your property and things like that, which we don't model in our, our version. Um, and then the last thing about storage is everything we found with storage is we end up um, putting storage in the residential areas um, for thermal storage as well as battery storage. We don't tend, to, the model doesn't tend to want to put it in vehicles for some reason, and we're still trying to work out why in terms of efficiencies. Or maybe it's because the model's too simplistic and it needs to know where the car is at any time, so it wants to put the stuff stationary. Um, and so that last 20% needs to be captured by some combination of all the other things that we're going to be talking about, demand response, uh, forecasting, shorter operational times, uh, and also uh, new, newer technologies, uh, ramping hydro more efficiently. At the moment, it's load following. Maybe it should be sort of quasi-auxiliary services in terms of providing that really big peaks in the morning and evening rather than natural gas and seeing if we can uh, use that. So uh, I'll leave with that, and I'll allow questions to be hurled.